Sean Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. We're going to explore what's going on with COVID later in the program. How big of a deal is this new variant? But we're going to begin with an incredible story that's been unfolding in the past week. We are getting a look at our past, our distant past, a moment more than 13 billion years in the making happening last Tuesday as the James Webb Space Telescope revealed its first five images to the world, and they are staggering. NASA calling it the dawn of a new era in astronomy. These images revealed a deep field of galaxies never before seen. What does it tell us about the oranges of our universe, our solar system, our planet? To make some sense of it, let's bring in Paul Geithner, NASA Deputy Project Manager for the James Webb Space Telescope. Great to see you, Paul. Thank you for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. Good to be here. Uh, you've got to be awake at night thinking about this because, you know, we talk about how long it took to get this off the ground. You've been working on it for 20 years or so, right? Yes, I started in 1997, so it's been a long time. Okay, let's show image one, and you can tell us, kind of describe what we're seeing because we're doing kind of cursory looks at this in newscasts. Let's take a little deeper dive because we've got some time to do that. This is called Galactic High Five. What are we seeing here, Paul? So this is uh, a group of galaxies that are interacting with each other. It's called Stefan's Quintet. But the galaxy that's on the left is actually a foreground galaxy. It's much closer than the others. But all those others are actually um, in the process of uh, falling into each other and merging. And um, what you're seeing is, uh, as these galaxies interact, the, the incredible tidal gravitational forces among them as they're coming together and um, uh, interacting with each other is creating um, a lot of new stars to be born. And um, it's, it really is pretty. I mean, scientifically, it's, it's, there's so much content here, but just visually, it's very pretty. Paul, someone explained that this would be as if someone on Earth held out a grain of sand at arm's length, and that's the amount of capture we're getting of the sky. It's a tiny, tiny slice. Is that about right? Um, yes, that's, that's one of the other images we released is... Uh, is that size of the sky, um, but just a tiny little sliver of the sky, uh, and we see thousands and thousands of galaxies. Um, there, there are maybe a trillion galaxies in the observable universe, and um, uh, so everywhere you look um, with this telescope, which can see deeper than any other telescope that's ever been built, uh, you just you see nothing but galaxies. There's no dark part of the sky. So Let's this, take this a is look the same uh, image that we just looked at, but in longer wavelength of light that Webb can see. And it tells us different things with the different wavelength of light we, we, uh, we use to look at things. Paul, um, it, it starts to, I think, even for people who are complete novices in this field, when you start to look at what we're looking at now, this idea that we're just some cosmic fluke here on Earth, it, it seems overwhelmingly the evidence would be that there is no way we're alone. Just no way. Sure. I'm, when you consider there are maybe a trillion galaxies in the observable universe, that's not the that's just the universe we can see. And every galaxy has maybe hundreds of billions of stars in it. Our Milky Way galaxy has several hundred billion stars in it. And most stars have planets around them. We're learning this. And even if a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of those planets uh, have conditions like we have here on Earth and have had time to develop uh, life. Uh, life elsewhere, it seems statistically likely. Life like us might be comparatively rare, like humans, but there's, the numbers are so um, incomprehensively large that there's, you have to figure there's a chance that there's other intelligent life out there somewhere. Um, Hopefully there is. That, that's a very difficult thing to prove, but the numbers say life is probably out there. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. Let's take a look at image number two. This is called Galactic High Five also. We may have just seen that here that went up, but it, it, kind, of, it kind of gives us a sense about the uh, galaxy evolution in the early universe. What is this telling us? 
So th these galaxies um, on the right of this image, they're about, if I recall correctly, uh, they're like 330 million light years away, which is sort of nearby. But um, you know, the evolution of galaxies through the history of the universe is is important to understand how we got here because we live in a galaxy, and um, that's how matter is organized in the universe. Dark matter and regular matter, like we're made of, is organized in the galaxy. So how galaxies form and interact over time uh, tells us a lot about how the universe came to be and how we came to be and what might happen in the future. What does it tell us about how young our galaxy is, comparatively? So, uh, so um, uh, the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy is pretty old, but um, the very first galaxies formed only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. That may, that may sound like a long time, but remember the universe is 13.8 billion years old and it went from nothing but a lot of dark uh, neutral hydrogen and helium, those are the only elements that, that came out of the Big Bang, um, to uh, create all the heavier elements and stuff like us within a, uh, a, just when the universe was only a few percent its current age. So a lot happened in that very early time, and that's the main reason we built Web was to um, actually visit that epoch in time and go, how did the lights turn on in the universe? Actually observe it and try to understand what happened. Paul, and, so, um, so what we're seeing right now from the distant yes. part of the, of the universe, mm -hmm. is some of this stuff not there anymore? In other words, it yes. took so long for it to travel the speed of light as we understand it, that some of this stuff may not even be around now? Sure. I mean, what you're looking at is uh, how things were in the past because light travels at a finite speed. So, for example, when you look at the sun in the sky, you're looking at the sun as it was eight minutes ago because it takes eight minutes for light to get from the sun <laughs> to the earth. Um, to get to the next nearest star, if you could travel at the speed of light, would take you four years. Um, so when we look at the very distant past to galaxies that are older than 13 billion years, um, we're seeing them as they were when that light was emitted that long ago. So we don't know what they're like now. But um, so what you're looking at is traveled time, really, because um, light takes time to travel. Has any of the stuff you've seen so far have the researchers looked at this and, and has anything turned conventional wisdom on its head? Um, not yet, but you know, we've only had a week to look at things. So the, uh, <laughs> the scientists that are looking at these, are, are their minds are blown because um, these were only mere hours worth of observations and there's so much uh, science, scientific content in these observations that, um, uh, they're just now scratching the surface on it. it I really believe that um, some of the greatest discoveries that Webb will make are answers to questions that we have yet to ask or imagine, frankly. Oh, wow. Um, it was, yeah, it That's... was built to do certain things, but it's going to do things we haven't thought of yet. It's really going to be amazing. The, the image that just blew my mind um, is the cosmic cliffs. This is image number three. A star is born is what it's called. Can you tell me yeah. what we're seeing here? This doesn't this even look the, real, by the way. Yeah, it's beautiful. This is the Carina Nebula. It's in our own galaxy. It's comparatively close by. The light you're seeing here is, uh, I forget the exact number, but it's thousands of light years away. So yeah, it took the light a long time to get here, but uh, cosmically speaking, this is a close by object in our own galaxy. And uh, what you're seeing here is uh, clouds of dust and gas that are leftovers from stars that uh, died, but they are, they're also the birthplaces of new generations of stars and planets. And um, you're seeing um, radiation from some hot new young stars in the top of the image, and it's kind of blowing some of the dust and gas away that you see at the bottom of the picture. And within the dust and the brownish and orangish areas at the bottom of the image, there are places inside where new stars and new planetary systems are forming. And 
yeah, visually, it, the, the science content is there. We're scientists are just scratching the surface on it, but um, you know, visually, it's it's stunning, and um, this is, yeah, it's very beautiful. Do how do we even date the Big Bang? How do we even try to come up with a date on that? So um, our lead scientist, uh, John Mather, won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006 for basically measuring the uh, echo of the Big Bang. Um, and by measuring how, uh, how much the, the light from that, uh, uh, from the Big Bang has been stretched, you can, um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a Doppler shift it's not the same thing, but you know, when you hear a police siren or mm -hmm. ambulance siren, as it's approaching you, it increases in pitch. And as it sure. recedes, it, it gets lower in pitch. Light is a wave, like, uh, like sound is a wave. And so when things are moving away, they, uh, they get lower in pitch or in light terms, they get redder in color. And so the, the radiation from the, the echo of the big bang is, um, red shifted so much that it shows up today as as microwave radiation when it used to be um ultraviolet and visible light and so, so you can measure it we can measure it wow. we can make a measurement of the temperature of the leftover of the big bang and work it backwards to go wow the universe is that old um there's a couple of different measurements that um one can do and we've made with lots of different instruments from balloons and from other spacecraft in space. And we, we know that the Big Bang happened almost 13.8 billion years ago. And by um, when we look at a very distant star or galaxy, we can look at the uh, spectral content of that light and see the uh, telltale uh, markers of um, certain elements like hydrogen or helium or oxygen or whatever and uh, go, oh, look, they are supposed to be here, but because they're moving so fast away from us, they're shifted all the way over here and to the redder end of the spectrum. And we can uh, measure how uh, far away they are and how fast they're moving from us um, that way. I wanted, to, I wanted to take a look at, uh, I believe it's number four. Um, okay. We'll put these couple more of these up. What are we seeing here? These are just, they uh, don't even look real again. Yeah, that's that's the Carina Nebula. I think that's the Carina Nebula again, just with different filters on one of the cameras. But yeah. I could be wrong. No, no so. that's right. That's right. Yep. Okay. Carina Nebula, and, and it, it gives us, I guess, a rare peek into the stars in their earliest rapid stages of formation. Yes. And, you know, one cool thing about Webb is um, because it sees mostly infrared light, which is... You, uh, a little bit longer wavelength of light than our eyes can see. Um, and you feel it as uh, some infrared light as heat radiation. So uh, what visible light gets blocked by dust and clouds, but infrared light uh, goes through it much more easily. And so we can peer inside dusty, dusty stellar nurseries to see new stars and new planetary systems uh, being born where they're forming. Um, this when you see really Paul, powerful. when you see these pictures, do you is, is there is there a difficulty in trying to figure out what's near field and what's far field in that photograph? Um, yeah, in the in the image, it can be hard to tell, but uh, by looking at the wavelengths of the light coming from the different objects, we can know uh, what's in the foreground and what's in the background. Because you do see some very bright stars that are in the image and. Um, most of those are foreground stars. They're a lot closer than the nebula itself. When you and think that we're, you know, when you think that we're struggling to try to get a, a plan to get to Mars, and that you talk about near field, I mean that's right in the backyard, and you start <laughs> looking at these images, it is absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, it's humbling. I mean, the universe yes. is really <laughs> great word. It is humbling to look at that. Yes. Paul, I want to leave with one more that is kind of in our backyard. It's image number six. I wanted to just have you take a quick look at this because not only can the Webb Space Telescope look really deep, but this is an incredible shot of Jupiter. Yes, this is a really cool shot of 
you know, Jupiter. It's the largest planet in our solar system. And uh, this is what it looks like at the infrared wavelengths of light that um, Webb's instruments can see. And uh, by looking at it in these different wavelengths of light, we can uh, learn about uh, different processes that are going on on and inside Jupiter. But th this is a cool, this is a cool picture. They're yeah. all really cool. Yeah. Paul Geithner is the NASA Deputy Project Manager for the James Webb Space Telescope. Paul, I can't thank you enough for your time. Congratulations, this is a long time coming and continued success and we'll have you back. Deal? Deal, thank okay. you very much. Paul, thank you, great, great stuff. Coming up next, problems here on Mother Earth. Former State Health Director Will Humble on the new COVID variant, BA5. How dangerous or not dangerous at all is this thing? Will joins us next on Newsmaker Saturday. Back on Newsmaker Saturday, I'm sure you've heard about it. The new COVID variant BA5, it's accounting for more than half now of all new infections. There's some concern about it, but you know, we've tried to be pretty measured on this program and a guy I think who's been really uh, straight with the public on this whole thing is former state health director, Will Humble on the new COVID variant. Will joins us now. He is also, as you know, the executive director of Arizona Public Health Association. 35 years in public health, so he knows what's going on. Will, good to see you again. Thanks, John. Good evening. I, I love seeing you. I thought maybe our, uh, our little, you know, soirees were a thing of the past, but here we go again. And what I'm hearing you kind of telling other people is that we're going to be getting new strains probably every six months. Is that about the long and short of it? Well, we're going to continue to get new strains. Uh, any new strain that comes along will be more transmissible than the previous ones or else it wouldn't take over. Um, and natural selection tells us that they tend to get less um, severe over time. And, and by the way, you know, this is a coronavirus and the cold viruses are all coronaviruses as well. So ultimately the end game here is uh, not to eradicate COVID-19 as a, as a virus, that's never gonna happen, uh, but each, cons each consecutive wave will be less and less problematic from a public health perspective. And you know, a couple of years from now, we will probably, this will be a distant memory, but the virus will still be circulating. Is, do people die of the common cold? That's a good question. I think for the most part, there you know there can be situations where people get a common cold, but that gets into their chest, which ends up causing um, symptoms, especially in the elderly, that result in pneumonia. By the way, pneumonia is a is a, is a leading cause of death in Arizona. It's right. right up there with falls and things like that. So sometimes it starts with a cold, seldom, but it can. Okay. So with that in mind, do, are we getting hysterical about? COVID, uh, in other words, if we're kind of dealing with an offshoot of a cold virus, even though this is a, a variation we haven't really seen before, why can't we just live with this as we do with the common cold? Well, it all depends on who you are. I mean, that's the bottom line. So for somebody like you or I, John, who are in good physical health, we don't really have complicated medical conditions. Um, we're unlikely, I mean, we may, either of us may get infected, even though it would be a either breakthrough case or a reinfection, um, but we're unlikely to have a bad health outcome from it. But there are people that do have complicated medical conditions where a reinfection or a breakthrough case is something that worries them, and rightfully so. So it all depends on who you are. Um, and I think from this point forward, really, and it has been this way for a long time now, is everyone needs to look at their own individual risk, figure out what that is, look at their risk tolerance, figure out, you know, do I really, do I want to do it? Does going to a play at Gamage mean a lot to me, even though I've got complicated medical conditions that I know I'll be, you know, in a crowded environment? Or do I like to go to Cardinals games so much that, uh, it, even though I know I'm at risk, it's, uh, I'm willing to do it. I mean, everyone's going to be making those kinds of decisions, even if they've got complicated medical conditions. So ultimately, it depends on who you are. Okay, so where are we now with shots and boosters? Are we at number three or four? I've lost, I've lost track. Oh, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know. I'm, what, I, what I pay more attention to is the weekly trends on hospitalizations. That is what tells me 
um, what I need to know to come onto programs this, like this. And one of the things I was curious about is when BA5, this new version of Omicron, became to take over from the previous versions, I was interested to just confirm my gut check, which is that in general, these new variants are more transmissible, more communicable, uh, but no more lethal. And that is what we're seeing in the hospitalization data is that even though we're in a pretty big wave of infection right now, and, and we do see an increase in hospitalizations, we're not seeing anything near the scale that we saw back in December or two years ago in December. Oh, and I looked at the death, the death curve on the information that you sent me prior to this interview, that has fallen off the cliff. Well, that, that's true, but I, and I should have said this in the text I sent you, you gotta, there's a couple week delay on that death curve, but, but what you're saying is true that we're not seeing, well, and even anecdotally, clinicians will tell you that even when they have folks in the intensive care beds, um, that seldom are they intubated, meaning that they have a tube in their throat to help them breathing, and seldom does it result in pneumonia the way it did in previous waves. Well, didn't we also come to the conclusion that intubating people was not a good thing? If we let them well, breathe on their own as much as we could, their outcomes were better. Yeah, well, you know, it's always a last resort for any clinician right. to intubate because you never know if you're going to be able to extubate. So you got to be careful about that and try any other strategy to keep those oxygen sats up. But in some cases, it was like a choice of intubating or letting the person pass away. When I looked at the hospital numbers in Arizona, it appears that we have plenty of headroom on hospital beds. There is no emergency on hospital beds anymore. Not now. Oh, absolutely. Right. And, and this is our slow time of year. Um, it, it, by the way, it was, you know, earlier this spring, the hospitals were still digging out of yeah. the backlog of some of those um, uh, procedures that were delayed because of that Omicron wave over the holidays. Uh, but by and large, they've caught up on those. And July and August, at June, July and August are our th slowest months in hospitals. It's a seasonal thing, um, winter visitors and et cetera. So we're back to somewhat of a se normal seasonal pattern, I would say. Okay, so it's really up to your own risk tolerance, what you wanna do, consult with your doctor. Do you believe that the public health people at this point are going to ask for mask mandates or any kind of shutdowns or restrictions on our movements? What do you think? I haven't seen any public health people suggesting that we do lockdowns or, or limitations on movements. There is still a pretty robust group of um, folks, and you can see them on Twitter and other places that are urging, you know, universal masking in public places. Um, you know, look, here's the way I look at it. That was a big enough challenge six months ago when there was a much more compelling argument for indoor requirements of masking. And I, I mean, it was, a, was like pulling teeth to make that happen when it really mattered. I just feel like it's a waste of time to, you know, do a clarion call for indoor masking when you when I know for a fact nobody's going to do it anyway or very few people. One more thing here, Will. Doctors at the CDC and the National Institutes of Health, we're hearing reports that a lot of them are frustrated because they say with no solid clinical data, agencies keep pushing vaccines for infants and toddlers, even for those who've already had COVID. They feel like the science isn't being followed. I'm, I know you've got to be watching this. What do you make of this? Look, ultimately, for your viewers out there, the best course of action for them is to talk to, you're talking about kids here, is to talk to your pediatrician. You know, if you go to community health center, talk to your frontline clinician about the questions that you have, about whether, um, you know, whether which, which of your kids need to get vaccinated, um, how many booster shots they should have, um, this is a real personal decision for parents. And the best thing to do is for them to really just talk to their pediatrician. I think that's great advice. Will Humble, great to see you. And uh, it appears we're going to be having you back because this isn't over, even though we thought it was. Or maybe it'll be about monkeypox. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. We're, we'll, we'll get to that one next time. Will Humble, thank you, Will. Great to see you. We're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday.